Today's tale finds us in the foyer of the British House of Commons. The date? 11th May 1812. Parliament was particularly quiet that day, with only around 60 MPs in attendance. All the same, a handful of merchants were milling around the foyer, waiting to be called in by those assembled. In amongst them, a slight, unassuming man in his early 40s. A mystery man of late a regular observer quietly entered the foyer, taking a seat by the fireplace. The reason for the hearings that day in front of a committee of 60? Well, their contemporary, the Prussian general Karl von Clausewitz, once said, War is a continuation of politics by other means. Well, this can go both ways. Politics can become another front in a war just as easily. In 1806, France, then ruled by Napoleon Bonaparte, slapped Britain with a trade embargo. Britain hit back with an embargo of their own in 1807, hitting the USA while they were at it. By 1812, a number of merchants were loudly complaining the embargoes were costing them their livelihoods, and begged Parliament to please reconsider them before they lost the shirts off their backs. The House agreed to hear from a selection of affected traders and discuss the matter further. The hearings were supposed to begin at 4.30 p.m., but all and sundry were waiting on just one man, Spencer Percival. Spencer Percival was a lawyer who entered politics in his early 30s. A Tory, he preferred the description a friend of Mr. Pitt, meaning William Pitt the Younger. A devoted family man with 13 children, with an aversion to hunting, drinking or gambling. One imagines Mr. Percival something of an outsider among the party. All the same, he became Prime Minister in 1809 and led under trying times. The once formerly Mad King George III was re-afflicted with his mystery illness. The Luddites protested the mechanisation of their former roles. The Peninsular War against Bonaparte and the Iberian Peninsula ground on. Up to a million people would die before the fighting was done. If Spain were his Vietnam, his Bay of Pigs would be the Walcheren expedition a failed invasion of the French-controlled Netherlands. In an effort to aid their allies, Austria, Britain landed 39,000 men on an island called Walcheren, now part of Zeeland. The Austrians had already been defeated and sent packing. The British were defeated, not by the French, but Walcheren fever, believed to be a mixture of two diseases, malaria and typhus. In the wake of 4,000 deaths to the disease, Britain ceded the island and left. Percival was, among other issues, against granting greater rights and freedoms to British Catholics. He did, however, approve of the abolition of slavery. All in all, he was an interesting guy, in charge at interesting times, and apparently well liked in the house. Today, as was sometimes the case, he was running late. The sun was out, the Prime Minister was full of the joys of spring, and insisted on walking into work that day. Back in the House of Commons, the examination had begun without the boss. James Stephen, MP for Grinstead, was busy interrogating Robert Hamilton, a potter who claimed the embargo was threatening to send him to the poorhouse. At 5.15, Percival arrived. Removing his coat, he glided through the lobby towards the door. Suddenly, as if out of nowhere, the stranger rose from his seat, drew a pistol, and fired a shot straight into the Prime Minister's chest. Percival hit the floor, exclaiming, I am murdered. The assassin was subdued, and later questioned, where he admitted his guilt, and told a tale of woe to the authorities. He was rather hastily tried two days later at the Old Bailey. So who was this mysterious assassin, and why kill the Prime Minister of Britain? John Bellingham is something of a mysterious figure, though largely so, down to poor record-keeping. He's believed born in 1769, probably in Huntingdonshire, then brought up in London. He was taken on as an apprentice to a London jeweller, but by the age of 16 found himself on a ship bound for China. The ship, the Hartwell, struck trouble on this maiden voyage. The captain came into conflict with his crew, who mutinied. Captain Edward Flott captured the mutineers 
and made for the Cape Verde Islands, off modern-day Mauritania, to hand them over to authorities. But he accidentally hit the desert island of Boa Vista, putting a stop to the mission. The crew of the Hartwell were rescued and returned to England. From here, Bellingham disappears from records until the late 1790s. A man of the same name opened a tin factory in the mid-1790s and went bust soon afterwards. I personally doubt that this is our guy. In 1798, Bellingham definitely shows up as an accounts clerk working in London. Around 1800, he secured a role as an agent for an import-export business and was sent to Arkhangelsk, Russia, formerly Russia's main trading port with Europe. His 1812 testimony states, by 1804, he was a merchant in his own right, trading with the Russians. Whatever the path that led Bellingham to Arkhangelsk, he claims he was there in 1804, when accused of causing another merchant's bankruptcy. Official documents put the incident two years earlier. In 1802, a ship, more coffin boat than seaworthy vessel, if the tale is to be believed, named the Sojus, wrecked while travelling from Russia to England. The ship was insured, allegedly over-insured, through Lloyds of London. It was likely to have been overloaded and decrepit, and as such a win-win for the merchant. Get to England safely, sell your goods, make your money, and try your luck again on the next voyage. Right. The ship sinks for the low, low cost of a few hundred lives the merchant could care less about. The merchant gets their payout from the insurer. Davy Jones's locker, more often than not, gets to keep the evidence. The merchant buys another broken down old vessel and gets to roll the dice again. In this case, however, the crew survived the wreck and were rescued in their entirety. Lloyds refused to pay the merchant, and rightly or wrongly, Bellingham was accused of tipping the insurers off to the fraud. Russian courts ordered him to recompense his rival merchant at a cost just shy of 5,000 rubles. He couldn't pay and was sent to jail. On release, he travelled to St. Petersburg, where he tried to have the governor of Arkhangelsk, General Van Brenen, impeached for having him wrongly jailed. This led to a further prison term. All up, he spent six years in prison in Russia before being released. Bellingham was suddenly homeless, left to beg for food on the streets of St. Petersburg. He managed to successfully petition the Tsar to pay for his ticket back to England and was repatriated in 1809. During his incarceration, he was bankrupted by his creditors. Also during his incarceration, he reached out to British Attorney General Lord Granville Levison Gower on multiple occasions. Levison Gower contacted the Governor of Arkhangelsk to request Bellingham be released. The Governor convinced the Attorney General Bellingham was guilty, so the British Crown left the Russians to it. On his return, Bellingham doggedly pursued the Crown for reparations, and when that went nowhere, took to sitting in the gallery at the House of Commons with a pair of opera glasses. He was there to stalk Lord Levison Gower, who was more than likely the original target for assassination. In April 1812, he took his coat to a tailor, who he paid to make an inner pocket big enough to conceal his pistol. It is a mystery as to why he shot Spencer Percival that day. It is generally speculated he mistook the Prime Minister, himself a former Attorney General, for his intended target. Evidence was presented as to Bellingham's insanity for the most part in the form of his letters demanding reparations, and witnesses who claimed he told them he had a £100,000 payout coming, from which he'd buy a country estate in the west of the country. Bellingham chose to brush that away in his own defence, in the hope others would see he had a legitimate right to recompense, denied him by the authorities. On 13th May, a jury of 12 men found him guilty of murder, the judge, Sir James Mansfield, ordered him to hang, and his body subsequently to be given to a medical school to be anatomised in front of the trainee doctors. Curiously, some members of the public did believe John Bellingham was well within his rights to murder a politician. 
René Martin Pillay, a French author present at the execution, later wrote of the mood of the crowd. Rather than the usual buzz which attended a hanging, the crowd was allegedly sombre. Many in attendance felt Bellingham was the real victim, treated abysmally from his arrest in Russia all the way up to his execution. The politicians were not listening to the people. This murder might just teach a few of them a little humility. Martin Pillay also wrote that a collection was taken for his widow, who suddenly found herself rich beyond her wildest dreams. John Bellingham's skull is kept at the Pathology Museum at Queen Mary University, London. A distant relative of his, Baron Henry Bellingham, is a Tory politician who sits in the House of Lords. In 1997, Bellingham, not yet a lord, lost his seat in the House of Commons to a Labour politician. A UKIP politician who split the right-wing vote caused the loss. That UKIP candidate was Roger Percival, a distant relative of former Prime Minister Spencer Percival. In 2012, Baron Bellingham expressed shame and sorrow for the actions of his forebear in a poorly attended public ceremony commemorating the 200th anniversary of the murder.